good to see the presence of each and every one of you here this morning. The weather's kind of cooled up, so it's uh, been a lovely morning, weather wise. We're wanting to point out to you that uh, there's no one. I do not believe that appreciates and likes for someone to take the advantage of them. But this is the very thing that Satan is trying to do with each of us. He wants to get in and take control of our lives. Paul, the apostle, was mindful of this, and repeatedly then he gave warning against it. Such as we find here in Ephesians 4.27, when he said, Neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. Some six words in that passage of Scripture. Well, this suggests to us a number of things. This suggests to us the fact that Satan can have a place in our lives because we're told not to give him a place in our lives. It also implies the fact that he wants that place and that he's going all out to get that place in our lives so that he can take the advantage of it. But also it points out to us that he cannot have that place in our life unless we give it to him. There the apostle gives the warning, neither give place to the devil. So he can't have it unless we give it to him. We simply don't have to give Satan a place in our lives, but we will unless, of course, we are mindful of his tactics. Satan, then, is out to get us. And it's up to us, then, to keep him from getting into our lives and taking the advantage of us. In Proverbs, the first chapter, in verse 10, Solomon wrote, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. In other words, we have the last choice about the matter. We don't have to give him a place in our lives. And then we're reminded of the passage in Mark, the third chapter, verse 27. When our Lord said, No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he'll spoil his goods. You know, the devil cannot enter into our house and spoil our goods unless he binds us. And he'll do that by entering into our lives and taking the advantage of us. This is true of him. However, before he can enter into our lives, he has to first bind us. And he does this by slipping into our lives. Then after getting a foothold, he will take the advantage of us. Just a little bit of a foothold. And then he'll take the advantage of us. The devil really won't leave us alone. The Apostle Paul uh, mentions that in Romans chapter 7 and verse 21. He will go to any end to destroy us. Paul said, have a law. And that law is a rule. And that law simply points out that when I would do good, then evil is present with me. You know, the devil then takes the advantage of every opportunity. It's something that we can expect. We can expect it. It's not a, a, an, an occasional thing, but it is the rule. It's the law that when I would do good, then evil is present with me. How many times can we think about doing good and then something comes up that we do not do it? But that was taking that opportunity then to keep us from that. It's something that we can expect. So how does Satan then get the advantage of us? And at the same time, how can we be on guard against him? The answer is found in the Bible, in the book of James chapter 4 and verse 7. Submit yourself to the Lord or to God. And then he said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we have to resist the devil so that he will flee from us. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, 
when he says in regard to Satan, as a roaring lion, you see the devil then, as a roaring lion, goeth about, seeking whom he may devour. And then Peter said, resist him in the faith. So we have to resist the devil. He is working day by day, trying to enter into our lives and get a foothold so that he can take the advantage of us. So there must be a constant resistance. You remember in the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, and in the 13th verse, after the devil had ended his temptation of Jesus, and when he had ended that, he departed from him for a season. You can just rest assured that he's going to try to come back. He leaves you alone just for a little while, so we have to be constantly on guard so that he will not come in, slip in, get a foothold, and take the advantage of us. So this morning for a little while, let us then consider some of the ways that Satan gets the advantage of us. We notice, first of all, that through our ignorance, we give Satan a foothold. We give him the advantage. Paul gave this warning to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse 11. Lest that he enters in and deceives us in entering in and taking hold of our life. Let's turn to the 2 Corinthians letter, if you would please. And we'll notice there the 11th verse of that second chapter. And here Paul is saying, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So if we are aware of his devices, then we can be on the alert. If not, if we are not knowledgeable of that, how he does it, well then we are going to be his prey. He's seeking then to get a foothold in our lives that he might take the advantage of us. And so here is the primary reason then and Paul gives a warning for that. If Satan can keep us in, his, in, in, in ignorance, I'll get that right in a minute. If Satan can keep us in ignorance, then he can keep us from God. You know, in John the sixth chapter and verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. If we have not learned of the Father, we can't come unto him. And the devil tries to keep us in ignorance in regards to God and his plan and his uh, service for us so that he can get the advantage of us. If Satan can keep us in ignorance, then he can keep us from God. In Luke the 11th chapter, in verse 52, knowledge here is referred to as the key, the key of knowledge. And we can see that with this key, we can unlock the door to the old man. We can know His will and obey His will and be recipients of the blessings that come from doing His will. Satan then realizes this and therefore he seeks to keep us in ignorance. You know, the devil is pleased more than anyone that I can imagine when we do not know what the Lord would require of us. And through study we, should, we can know how to approve ourselves in the sight of God. Paul in 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Tell it to show thyself a prisoner unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's important that we study. Why is it? So that we can know the will of God. And why is it important that we know the will of God? So that we will not be deceived by the devil as he tries to get into our lives and take the advantage of us in that way. Well, ignorance then, according to that, would be a no excuse for not doing his will. In the 17th chapter of the book of Acts in verse 30, the Bible says that ignorance then is no excuse. We cannot offer excuses for not knowing what God would have us to do. In the time of this ignorance, God winked at, now commanded all men everywhere, he says to me, a repeat. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, in verse 29, we find here that Jesus points out that it's through ignorance 
you shall, uh, he points out this in regards to truth and our being ignorant of it, that it brings the devil into a position of getting into our lives. And then in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, the time that Hosea and the long ago said, For God to the people, he said, Because of ignorance, you did this. And he says here that, you know, ignorance is of no excuse in so many words. And so they were destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Hosea 4 and 6. Ignorance was one reason for the Babylonian captivity in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13. So we must be aware then of the wiles of the devil. In Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, that they were to put on the whole armor of God, that they might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So that's the reason why that we need to have knowledge. We must be aware then of the cunning craftiness whereby he lied away to deceive. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 3, we also must keep in mind the way of being put to test that here the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church at Corinth, he simply said, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled me through his subtlety, even so, he said, Your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity of the faith that's in Christ Jesus. So the devil then is at work. And uh, it depends upon how well we are informed of his devices and how well we are informed of the word of God. If we're not, then of course he's going to get the advantage of us. We're all his targets. Sin, in Romans 7 and 11, deceives. And also in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, why he said, I exhort you that you uh, be not deceived. In, in regards to the teachings and the things around about them. So we want to keep in mind that we can deceive ourselves, and the worst kind of deception, of course, is self-deception. Also, we recognize the fact that ignorance is what crucified Christ. In the book of Luke, we find in the 23rd chapter in verse 34, when Jesus finished his uh, suffering on the cross just prior to his uh, departing this life, his spirit leaving his body. He said, Father, forgive me. That's one of the seven statements made from the cross. Father, forgive me. Why? For they know not what they do. Had they fully known what they were doing, do you think salvation would have been offered to them? They were in ignorance. And Christ now dying on the cross certainly made it possible for them to be forgiven of that. But we can see that ignorance is what crucified the Lord. Ignorance then, we can see, is brought about because we lack understanding of God's will. How well, uh, how well acquainted are you then with the Lord's teaching? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. Do you know what God requires of you? That vengeance do you know that vengeance will be meted out to those who know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and in verse 8. Do you know what to do to be saved? If not, well then we need to keep this admonition given by Paul in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 when he said, Examine yourselves whether you in, are in the faith. Know ye not your own self how that Jesus Christ uh, is uh, uh, crucified and how that uh, we can have that salvation in Him. We need to be informed. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Paul said, Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. You know, he would not give a command to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good if he didn't think that we would be able to know way of the Lord and be able to discern that which is good. And so we need to give, that, uh, give heed to that admonition. We're told in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 6 
that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. And Romans 10 and 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so we need then to heed that admonition. It's more than just knowing what we are to believe, and yet we must do what we believe, what we learn. Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, said James in James 1 and in verse 22. <clears throat> Have you deceived yourself in any way so that the devil will take the advantage of it, get a foothold in your life and take the advantage of it? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3 lets us know that we can do that and we need to realize that so that we can avoid it. Man is nothing really until he surrenders completely to the Lord. And before he completely surrenders to the Lord, he must then repent. Not only does the Bible say the time of ignorance that God winked at now commanded all men everywhere to repent, but in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, we can see that that is also taught that is necessary. And Luke 13 and 3, we find that Jesus said, I tell you nay, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. But that individual then who wants to know God's will and do it, not only must hear the word so that he can have faith, faith come by hearing. It's not coming by being able to feel better one day and the next day you're not feeling so well. That doesn't come that way. It comes by hearing the word of God. So he has to surrender himself, he has to repent of his sins, and then he must make a good confession of his faith. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, we find that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That confession, of course, is, as you noticed in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts this morning in Bible class, it simply is to confess our faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So unless someone, unless someone did, would deceive you into thinking that that is all that man must do in order to be saved, we must keep in mind the teachings of the Bible. But in Acts 2, verse 38, these people who had been convinced that they had crucified the Son of God, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Remember Peter said in verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there is baptism. Let no one tell you that baptism is not necessary. When Peter said in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, The like figure for the baptism that also now save us. So it's through ignorance then that Satan can take an advantage of us. And so we need to take the warning of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he says that no man deceive you. Now in the second place we find that through indifference and negligence we can give Satan the advantage. We know that we can give him the advantage when we do not know it will through our ignorance of God's work. Now that doesn't mean that we are ignorant to the point we can't learn anything it just simply means that we're un we uninformed. We do not know what is taught. And so now through indifference and negligence, we know what has been taught. And so we are indifferent toward that teaching. We are neglecting that teaching. And in doing that, we give Satan the advantage. In Hebrews chapter 2, in verse, verses 1 through 3, we can see that the writer of the Hebrew letter says, Therefore, we need to... The, Give attention or give heed to that thing which has been taught. You know, the Lord from the very beginning taught, and then he taught through his disciples, and then we can see how shall we escape in verse 3 of that reading. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You know, the question carries its own answer. And that answer is you can't escape. How can, shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first 
was spoken by the Lord and confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And the next verse says, God uh, also bearing them with us, both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. So how sobering these words are. There is really too much then indifference and negligence in the world today. How many times will people say, well, I know what I need to do, but I just, I just neglected to do that. I just, uh, well, that's not going to excuse you. The Lord cannot tolerate lukewarmness. In the Revelation letter, chapter 3, when the Lord addressed the church at Laodicea, He said, I know thy works, how that thou art neither cold nor hot, and then he said, if you were cold or hot, well, then that would make a difference if, uh, to him. But being lukewarm makes him sick in his stomach. He said, he would spew you out of his mouth. And so it's not enough than just to think about it and be lukewarm. You've got to be acting and doing God's will. First Corinthians 9, the Apostle Paul used the a matter of a race. So run that you may receive. One receives the train. Only the individual who endures to the very end, as Jesus taught in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58 when he said, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labors are not in vain in the Lord. So we have to be active. We have to not be lukewarm. He's not pleased with that. And so this gives the devil the advantage. Do you recall that the Lord's statement made by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 and 12 when he says, take heed lest you fall? We need to take heed lest we fall. And then do you realize that a child of God can fall when Jesus taught him the, and in the 15th chapter of the book of, of John in reference to the vine and the branches? And he said, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them in the fire of their burn. You see, negligence brings sad results. And then, of course, the Apostle Paul had something to say about that in Romans 12 and 11, that we need to be, uh, you know, zealous about serving the Lord. Chapter 12, he simply points out the fact that we be conformed not to this world, but be uh, transformed, that we uh, can stand approved with God. And we have to put the Lord first. Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord taught that. In verse 33, he said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. In the Colossian letter, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, If you then be risen with Christ, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. If you be risen with Christ, we need to set our affection then on things above, and not just on earthly things. Yes, we need earthly things for the physical body, and to have our life sustained in it. But the most important thing is, that we seek first the kingdom of God. In the third place, then, we can see that through giving up, we give Satan the advantage. If we give up, that's the reason that as we get older, we need to realize that the race is almost complete, almost run. We don't want to give up now before we cross the finish line. And so we need to keep in mind that giving up, then, gives the Satan, gives the devil a, a foothold in our lives so that he can come in and take the advantage of us. The Bible points out that we be not worried and well doing in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. So when we are prone to give up, let's remember that. Be not weary in well doing for in due season he said he shall reap if he faint not. And we can see too that in Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 33, there again, in regards to seeking first the kingdom of God. Notice now, we shall reap if we walk, if we faint not. And this means that we shall reap if we do not lose heart, if we do not just simply become discouraged to the point that we'll just throw in the towel. 
and we just give up. We can't do that. Remember one individual that was speaking for us. I, I said, you know, I believe it's Keith Cable mentioned the fact about this boxer, and he was being beaten to the pub, and, and yet he said, just give me one more round, one more round. So let's just keep that in mind. One more round, and we can endure to the end, and we'll not give the devil the advantage. It isn't the start, but the finish that really counts. When Paul in the Galatian letter, chapter 5, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? And he asked the question then, who did hinder you from obeying the truth? So something hinders, and we can't allow that. The Lord assures us that whosoever is born of God, overcome. And he said, this is the uh, faith that overcometh the world, or even our faith, that gives us the victory. This is the victory. So faith is the victory that overcomes discouragements. Faith is the victory that overcomes fear, overcomes disappointment and sadness. In the first book of John, chapter 5 and verse 4, this is the, uh, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so we must keep that in mind. If we're going to keep the devil from slipping in and taking the advantage of our lives. In the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, in verse 13, is a is a very important passage. It's not very long. But he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Keep that in mind. I can do all things through Christ. We've got to be in Christ before we can do all things through Christ. And when we do that, well, then we can keep the devil from taking the advantage of us. The Lord will help us if we just simply stay close to him in Hebrews 13 and Verses 5 and 6. If we just draw nigh to him and stay nigh to him, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He cares for us. Now in the fourth place, we can see that through excuse making, we can give Satan the advantage. Through excuse making, we can give Satan the advantage. Nothing pleases the devil more than making excuses for not doing what God would have us to do. Too many people today major in alibiology. That's the word that I don't know if you can find it in the dictionary or not, but we make an alibi. And we can see that the worst bite is an alibi. You just can simply are cheated in the day. You're going to lose out on that. Well, the reason that sounds good is not always a good reason. We are offered various number of excuses. For example, we might say, well, I'd have been there if the ox hadn't been in the ditch. Well, we realize, of course, that Jesus taught that the ox gets in the ditch once in a while and needs to be pulled out. But I don't think he teaches the fact that we're to put the ox in on Saturday night so we can bring him out on Sunday morning. I don't think he, he had that in mind. So making excuses then will certainly then give the devil the a uh, foothold and he takes the advantage of it. Let us not then give Satan the advantage by making excuses. Let us bring into captivity the things that uh, would keep us under the Lord uh, in 2 Corinthians 10 and in verse 5. Now then in our closing with Mark, Satan can get the advantage. He can slip into our lives and he can take the advantage of us. Just getting a foothold. But also, he'll not be able to do that unless you get it to him. And so we need to remember the statement made by, by James in James 4 and 7. Submit to the Lord and resist the devil and he'll flee from you. If you give yourself completely to the Lord, you will not give Satan one single advantage. If not a Christian, then you are giving him the effect. You're giving him a place in your life. And we have to lay aside all excuses and obey the Lord's plan, which includes for the alien sinner, the one who's not a Christian, hearing the word of the Lord so that we can have Bible faith, 
the kind of faith that will move us to action and doing what else the Lord requires of us, which is uh, repentance and confession of our faith. Not confession of our sins at this point, but the confession of our faith. And then being buried with the Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. Also, we want to get rid of the excuses that might keep us from living the Christian life. And if that be the case, we need to acknowledge that to the Lord and to our brethren and have their prayers on our behalf that we might have the forgiveness. Of course, followed by one turning from sin in repentance that keeps him from serving the Lord faithfully. This morning, neither give place to the devil. The apostle Paul the morning still applies to us. And if you're here, you're subject to the Lord's invitation in any way. Well, then we encourage you to come.